Hello and welcome to Everything Boats with Captain Franklin here. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the boat buying process. I've taken a uh, number of articles that I have posted on my site in the past or my YouTube channel in the past on the boat buying process and I've combined them to show you what you can expect uh, from start to finish. You're looking for a boat, uh, you find the boat, you test it, uh, you have it surveyed, and then if you purchase the boat, what you as the new owner should do uh, from a legal registration standpoint to outfitting the boat. So take a look at these articles and I hope you enjoy them. And if you do, please like, subscribe, and share with all your friends. Boat Buying 101. The basic steps for buying a boat uh, sound pretty simple. Uh, find the boat, fall in love, buy the boat, then sail off in the sunset in search of paradise, and those drinks with the little umbrellas in them. Things tend to be a little more complex in reality, however, particularly as the days of purchasing a boat on a handshake and your word are long gone. In addition to the owner, today's buyer can expect to deal with yacht brokers, marine surveyors, bankers, underwriters, lawyers, as well as plenty of paperwork purchase contracts, survey reports, documentation requirements, and the like. Even the simplest deal will typically involve at least three people, the owner, a yacht broker, and a marine surveyor. In this uh, discussion, we're going to be looking at the key elements of a basic boat purchase and what you as the buyer can and should expect from the various people involved. Although our example here focuses on buying a used boat, much of it can be applied to new vessel purchases as well. In a typical boat buying scenario, the buyer makes an offer to the owner via the broker in the form of a purchase contract, a document that formally conveys the proposed terms of sale, the amount offered by the buyer, conditions of acceptance, closing dates, etc. The purchase offer is normally accompanied by a good faith deposit, typically 10% of the sale price, which is then placed in a bank trust fund or escrow account administered by the broker. After the purchase contract is received and reviewed, the seller either accepts it, rejects it, or proposes a counteroffer. Once signed by both parties, the purchase agreement becomes a legally binding contract between buyer and seller. As with any business transaction, the cardinal rule is to get everything in writing. Payment terms, accessories that convey with the boat, obligations agreed to between the buyer and the seller, as well as when they'll be fulfilled, should all be in there. The purchase agreement is a broker-drafted document that should reflect what the buyer wants to communicate. In other words, don't be afraid to insist that it be modified to include the terms you want or exclude stipulations you don't prior to submission to the owner. A key example of this would be inclusion of language stating that the sale of the vessel is contingent upon the findings of a marine survey. With this, the purchase contract now additionally serves as a safety net for the buyer, allowing him or her to cancel the deal without penalty should serious defects be found during the survey or the ability to renegotiate the selling price with regards to the correction of less serious problems. Finding the right broker. When called to discuss a boat listing, a professional broker will listen closely to the potential buyer to help determine if the boat they're calling about is the best value to meet their wants and needs. The broker should also objectively describe the condition of each vessel beforehand to help the buyer decide if it's worth a look and to provide amplifying information such as the vessel's history, outfitting, how long it's been on the market, and how motivated the seller may be uh, to make a deal. Professional brokers will additionally assist with the required paperwork to make the sale as efficient and painless as possible, from the initial purchase offer to the bill of sale, as well as registration or documentation and titling, taxes, certificates of ownership, etc. They'll also manage the escrow account, which helps both buyer and seller avoid potential problems that may occur in the private sales, such as the buyer fails to honor the offer and deposit or the owner absconds with the funds prior to sale. It's important, however, for the buyer to keep their relationship with the broker in perspective. Yacht brokers are essentially the marine equivalent of a real estate agent in that the boat owners hire them to list, represent, and sell their property. Like real estate agents, they also work on commission. 
meaning that while they have a duty to both buyer and seller during any transaction, it should never be forgotten that they work for and are paid by the seller to make the deal happen. Buyers also have the option of retaining a broker to represent their interest while helping to locate and purchase a vessel. Good ones not only step you through the entire boat buying process, but also help determine and find the type of boat that best suits your needs, assist with financing, and help negotiate a contract with the seller's broker once a boat is found. The Marine Survey Once the purchase offer is accepted and agreed to by both parties, the next step is having the vessel surveyed by a competent Marine surveyor. Inexperienced buyers may view a Marine Survey as just one more red taped festooned hoop they're forced to jump through to purchase or insure the boat of their dreams. But in reality, the money spent for a good marine survey is the best investment they'll ever make when purchasing a vessel. Blisters, delamination, and rot are just a few examples of what can be hidden beneath that new paint job or shiny coat of varnish. A competent marine surveyor can ferret out such issues before they become the buyer's problem often saving them potentially thousands of dollars in repair cost, while subsequently paying for the cost of the marine survey many times over. Finally, if the vessel being purchased will be financed or insured, a survey will almost certainly always be required by the bank, underwriter, or both in many cases. As such, it only makes sense to have the survey conducted prior to purchase. At least then the buyer has the option of negotiating repairs and such with the owner or finding a better boat. A pre-purchase condition and value survey or CNV survey is likely the most comprehensive inspection a vessel will ever receive. A typical CNV survey includes examination of the vessel's structural integrity, electrical system, electronics, propulsion system, fuel system, machinery, installations, navigation, and other miscellaneous onboard systems, as well as examination of the vessel's papers, registration, hull number, and all safety equipment. The haul-out portion of the survey includes an inspection of the hull and all underwater machinery, props, shafts, rudders, etc., while the sea trial provides the surveyor valuable insight on how the vessel and her systems operate and interact in the real world. Each survey report will include a recommendation section listing deficiencies and problems noted during the survey. Coupled with the personal observations of an experienced surveyor, the findings of a CNV survey are an excellent tool to aid the buyer in assessing whether the vessel meets their particular needs. What the surveyor won't say, however, is whether or not you should purchase the boat. The surveyor's role is to provide an unbiased expert analysis of the vessel's condition to assist the buyer in making an informed decision on whether or not to proceed with the purchase. Finding a Marine Surveyor It's the buyer's responsibility to research and select the best surveyor to represent their interest. The best recommendation for a Marine Surveyor is reputation and word of mouth. However, even then you'll want to research each possible choice to ensure you select the most qualified surveyor to inspect your particular vessel. Even highly competent surveyors can have different backgrounds or specialities. If you're buying a racing sailboat, for example, you probably don't want to use a surveyor whose primary experience or field of expertise deals with commercial fishing vessels. While marine surveyors are not licensed by any state or federal agency, they can be accredited or certified by certain membership organizations. A good place to start your search for a reputable surveyor is by contacting the Society of Accredited Marine Surveyors, SAMS, or the National Association of Marine Surveyors, NAMS, and obtaining a list of member surveyors in your area. Some banks or insurance companies may provide a list of surveyors they accept, but you'll still want to research the qualifications of any surveyor prior to hiring them. Brokers may also supply a list of recommended surveyors. In most cases, this is provided in a good faith effort to help the buyer find the right surveyor. However, be aware that in some cases, surveyors may be listed because the broker has found them easier to work with in that they may be a little more lenient when surveying a vessel. In any event, you'll want an independent surveyor whose only interest in the vessel is to provide you, the buyer, the best survey possible. Research any surveyor thoroughly, regardless of whatever list they're on, and make your own decision based on the results. What to expect? Buyer expenses to this point typically include the surveyor's fee and cost of the haul-out, which normally takes place at a yard chosen by the owner. 
The owner in return is normally responsible for transporting the vessel to and from the haul out facility as well as any costs associated with the sea trial. Vessel captain, fuel, anything related to the sea trial. The broker will orchestrate the survey, haul out, and sea trial in efforts to ensure each goes smoothly. However, it's a good idea for the buyer to be present during all phases of the survey. This provides the opportunity to observe firsthand the surveyor's inspection of the vessel, as well as ask any questions that may come up during the survey. That being said, buyers should refrain from bringing anyone who does not have a direct interest in the purchase. These include friends, relatives, small children, pets, any of these as they can cause unnecessary distractions during the survey. Finally, if a potential surveyor refuses to allow clients to accompany them during the survey, find another one. You are paying for the survey after all, and you should be able to observe all phases of it if desired. With the possible exception of an impromptu Miss Miami Beach contest I witnessed back in 2008, no other event more accurately embodies the phrase sensory overload than a boat show. It's extremely easy to get swept up in the carnival-like atmosphere of a typical boat show as boat manufacturers hawk their latest models, each decked out with the latest in visual splendor and operational gadgetry. Dealers and brokers often bemoan having to deal with hull thumpers, the marine equivalent of a tire kicker, but it pays to do your homework and thoroughly examine even new boats before unwittingly making their potential problems your own. Here's how to navigate the treacherous shoal waters of a typical boat show and find the perfect boat for you. First of all, uh, let's talk about dressing to inspect. As some of the boat checks uh, may involve cockpit crawling and bilge diving, wear comfortable clothing and shoes to the boat show. A flashlight and possibly a pair of light coveralls will help you get down and dirty without too much of the ladder. As most dealers require that you remove your shoes prior to boarding, slip-on type shoes rather than those requiring lacing will save you some time. Uh, stay organized. As boats can blur together during the course of a show, use a tablet or old school style notepad along with plenty of photos uh, to help keep you organized and keep track of details for review afterwards. Design and layout. The first thing to do here is step back and view the boat as a whole. Is it ergonomically designed? Are the cockpit, helm, and interior spaces laid out to allow a natural flow while moving through the vessel? Can specific areas, the galley for example, be used without blocking access to the rest of the interior? Take an imaginary test drive. Are all controls, instrumentation, and electronics within view and easy reach of the helm? Uh, is there room in the helm for future electronic installations? How about visibility? Is it good while seated and while standing? Is there sufficient seating or backrest at a comfortable angle? And is there plenty of leg room? Lie in the bunks, stand in the galley, and sit on the toilet. Are they comfortable and functional or seemingly designed for someone with Area 51 body dimensions? Is the interior of the boat adequately lit and well ventilated with good air exchange and lockers and other storage areas to promote quick drying and prevent mold and mildew? What about available storage? The first rule of boating when it comes to storage is you can't have too much of it. This includes not only room for the supplies needed for that day or weekend trip, but also specialty racks and holders for fishing gear, wakeboards, and the like. What about the bilge? Is it deep enough to collect water, but shallow enough to provide easy access to clean it? Does it have a drain plug at the deepest part of the bilge? A properly located drain plug allows you to more easily wash the bilges and drain them when winterizing or storing the boat ashore. Uh, quality of construction. Here's where you need to look past the gleaming gel coat and varnished wood to verify that the beauty actually is more than skin deep. Start by walking around the boat and inspecting the hull for abnormalities, dimples, bulges, stress cracks, and the like, while verifying that the hull to deck joint is uniform and free from irregularities. Press on the hull at various areas to gauge how much it flexes. Does it look, and more importantly, feel solid? Lift up the floorboards, open the lockers, and remove cabinet drawers to gain as much access as possible to interior spaces. Are the hatches finished on the inside as well as on the outside? 
check the cabinets are firmly attached to the hull and that large items, refrigerators, microwaves, etc., are securely mounted with adequately sized brackets and hardware to prevent movement in rough seas. Check construction of the hull to deck joint from inside. It can typically be sighted at the bow, anchor road storage area, or cockpit lockers. Is the joint bolted and caulked, glued together, or even better, fiberglassed over? Or does it use screws or pop rivets, both of which produce a weaker joint? Look for gaps and bulges, which may be an indication of poor fit or construction. Structural bulkheads should be bonded to the hull with multiple layers of fiberglass tabbing, three inches wide minimum. Uh, bulkhead to hull joints should also employ fillets or radiuses to eliminate localized stress points or hard spots in the hull, which can lead to fiberglass cracking and damage. On deck, look for high quality bronze or stainless steel fittings. Verify that all deck hardware, cleats, anchor windlasses, bow railings, are properly bedded, caulked, and through bolted with oversized backing plates. Accessibility and ease of maintenance. The worst thing about boat maintenance is often accessibility. This can be especially true of inboard engine installations where too much horsepower has been shoehorned into too little uh, space. Open the engine hatch and note the location of items you'll need to access on a regular basis. The dipstick for the oil, coolant reservoirs, oil filters, spark plugs, and the like. Uh, locate all through hull seacocks. Can you physically reach them without possessing arms like an orangutan? Can they be fully open and closed, or are they blocked by hoses, stringers, or other obstacles? What about the batteries? Are they securely mounted and located in an area that provides access for both routine maintenance and replacement? How about fuel tank location and accessibility for inspection and repairs should problems arise? Aluminum fuel tanks installed below cockpit decks on many center consoles and other open type models can be prone to corrosion, particularly if foamed into place during construction. The foam often retains moisture. Or if the tank bottom has inadequate clearance and often rests in bilge water. Uh, models with removable deck panels above the fuel tank offer the best option should the tank need replacing. But keep in mind that the caulking for the panel must be maintained and occasionally renewed to prevent water from leaking onto the top of the fuel tank, causing corrosion. And we're talking aluminum fuel tanks here. Uh, finally, Boat shows are a great place to search for special deals and incentives and rebates when buying a new boat. They also offer an easy way to view and physically compare a number of different models and brands at the same time. Don't be afraid to ask questions or roll up your sleeves to get the best deal possible. How to Buy a Better Used Boat by Captain Frank Lanier Searching out a bargain seems to be written in the collective human DNA. Uh, beating the printed price is the modern substitute for bringing down that woolly mammoth and feeding the family for a month. But all too often, the bottom line becomes the end-all be-all of the hunt. Some things cost less for a reason, and sometimes these reasons outweigh the supposed good deal. Here's a look at six pitfalls that can turn your dream boat into the proverbial hole in the water. Pitfall number one, engine problems. Engines are the single most expensive piece of gear on board. A hard lesson to learn after purchasing that deal of a lifetime and finding out that a rebuild or replacement is required. Warning signs. Start by looking for obvious problems such as leaks, excessive rust, broken components, and the like. Check coolant level and properties for closed systems. Uh, lack of antifreeze should raise red flags possible leaks, as should cool it with a rusty color or an unusual amount of solids. Uh, pull the dipstick and check the oil. A slightly low level may be okay, but a higher than normal level could be a sign of trouble, especially if the oil is milky or frothy, an indication water, antifreeze, or transmission fluid is present, uh, which could mean anything from blown gaskets to a cracked block. Smell the oil. Burnt smelling oil is an indication of overheating. Then wipe the dipstick on a clean white cloth or napkin. Oil that's thick initially but then starts to spread out over the cloth is an indication of fuel contamination. How difficult is the engine to start? Depending on the engine, whether it's gas or diesel, hard starting could be caused by anything uh, from weak batteries and faulty plugs to bad fuel pumps. Uh, how does the engine sound? Does it run smoothly at idle and under load or does it idle unevenly and stall out when placed in the gear? Uh, rough running can be caused by anything from clogged fuel filters to compression problems. While engines idling at more than 800 RPM, 
may have been set high to mask idling problems. Uh, verify proper oil pressure and operating temperature. Low oil pressure could be due to anything from faulty oil pumps to cam bearing failure. Uh, high water temperatures may be something as simple as a bad impeller, but could also be caused by corroded manifolds or exhaust risers. Uh, read the smoke signals. A well-maintained engine may smoke when initially cranked or while idling, but not when warmed up or under load. Uh, smoke color can also provide an indication of problems, blue for burning oil, black for incomplete combustion, and the like. Uh, fight or flight mechanism here. Have the engine surveyed by a competent marine mechanic, then discuss repair options and cost. Remember that hour meters mean nothing, as they can be easily swapped out by an unscrupulous seller, and that an owner should eagerly provide invoices if claiming overhauls of major work uh, that's been done on the engine. When people spend money on a boat, they're going to be happy to show you these invoices. Look at what these robbers charged me to do this, right? Uh, if they can't provide you with invoices for work that they claim has been done, uh, then lacking the documentation, we assume nothing's been done. Uh, engines are a big ticket item, so always weigh the cost of the repair or replacement of the engine versus simply walking away and finding a boat that doesn't need a new engine. Fiberglass hull blisters. Uh, while steel hulls rust and wood hulls rot, it's blisters that make a fiberglass boat owner's hair stand on end. The Cliff Notes version of how blisters form is simple. Water-soluble chemicals inside the laminate exert an osmotic pull on water molecules outside the hull, drawing them through the gel coat. Once inside, the water molecules and soluble chemicals join to create a solution with larger molecules that are unable to pass back through the gel coat. As water molecules continue to enter, pressure increases to the point that the gel coat is pushed outward, forming a blister. Uh, some makes and models seem to be more susceptible to blistering than others, presumably due to factors ranging from resin use to layup schedules. Uh, but all boats are at some risk. Location also plays a factor. Uh, relocating a vessel from cool to tropical waters from fresh to salt, etc. could cause blisters where there were none previously. Uh, warning signs? The best time to spot blisters is just after the boat is hauled, preferably after the hull has been power washed and is still wet. Blisters can depressurize in a matter of hours once the vessel is hauled, minutes in some cases, making them all but impossible to spot. Uh, something to consider if inspecting a boat that's been hauled for a while. Uh, blisters will typically appear as circular bumps or dome-like protrusions while siding along the hull. Sometimes water trapped between the bottom paint and gel coat forms bumps that can be mistaken for blisters. With the owner's permission, try pressing a suspected blister with a rubber gloved finger. Uh, be sure to wear goggles as blisters can be under considerable pressure. If the fluid that comes out has a chemical styrene smell, chances are it's a blister. Fight or flight. Although hull blisters and terminal cancer are often viewed with the same level of dread, Finding one or two blisters on an older vessel is no more serious than an occasional gouge to the hull. In this case, spot your treatment of individual blisters as they occur, uh, grinding them out to good material, barrier coating, and then filling it and fairing it with a suitable epoxy mixture uh, will normally suffice. Far worse is the dreaded pimple rash or boat pox, where the entire bottom is covered with hundreds or thousands of blisters. Uh, repairs in this case uh, involve removal of the entire gel coat and skin out mat to good laminate and then adding additional laminate to return the hull to original strength. Uh, this is an expensive repair that many yards will gladly perform but rarely guarantee will prevent future blister formation. Finally, be aware that the presence of blisters may very well have a negative impact on a vessel's resale value depending on a potential buyer's perception of blisters. Pitfall number three. Wet and delaminated decks. Water intrusion into core decking likely causes more boat damage every year than sinkies, groundings, and fires combined. Cord construction simply means that you've got an inner and outer layer of fiberglass sandwiching some material in between them. Uh, this could be ingrain balsa, plywood, or maybe one of the more high-tech foam variations. Uh, the prime directive with cord construction is keeping water out, particularly with balsa or plywood. Wet coring can rot, allowing the cord deck to separate, drastically reducing structural integrity. Long-term water exposure causes problems with foam cord decks as well. Uh, core separation, freeze damage, and even disintegration in some cases. Warning signs. 
The first step, literally, in finding deck problems can be as simple as walking on them. Soft spots, oil canning or flexing, or even water squishing from deck fittings while you walk on them are all in indicators of potentially expensive repairs. Uh, drips and brownish stains below decks are also common signs of water-soaked decks and rotting core. Uh, sound out decks by tapping on them with a small plastic-headed hammer or the end of a screwdriver handle. Sharp, crisp sounds while tapping are what you want, uh, while dull thuds can be an indication of delamination. Moisture meters are also an excellent tool for sniffing out soggy decks. Fight or flight. While repair costs will be directly related to the size of the delaminated area, Cutting open a deck for core replacement is never cheap. If a deck flexes like the moonwalk you rented for Junior's birthday, run or get ready to lay out some serious cash. Pitfall number four, structural issues. Fractured bulkheads, loose fiberglass tabbing, or cracked floors and stringers, the internal supportive grid work of the hull, are all common signs of excessive hull flexing and stress overload. Warning signs, uh, start by accessing as much of the interior hull and support structure as possible. Look for rot, broken bulkhead tabbing, and fractured fiberglass where stringers and floors meet. Pay in particular attention to those that provide support for the engine. A strong flashlight and an inspection mirror are good tools to have while looking for damage. A small digital camera or your phone will also be a big help. Stick it in hard to access areas and snap pictures in all directions for review later. Uh, fight or flight. While repairs may seem pretty straightforward, multiple sightings of broken tabbing and cracked stringers or floors should be viewed as an indication of much more serious issues from a weakly built hull to repairing projects that place excessive stress on the boat due to increases in engine weight, horsepower, or both. Pitfall number five, electrical woes. After years of additions, removals, misguided MacGyverisms, and overall abuse, probably no system harbors greater potential for starting a fire on a used boat than the electrical system. The warning signs start with the batteries. They should be in liquid-tight, acid-proof containers or trays and secured against movement. Be on the lookout for equipment hot-wired directly to the battery, a potential for fire hazard, as well as crowded post syndrome. Uh, which is more than four wires connected to a single battery post. Uh, check the overall condition of the wire runs. They should be neat and well organized and labeled. Problems include unsupported wires, dead ends, cut wiring no longer in use but left in place, uh, corrosion and lack of chafe protection, especially where wires pass through a bulkhead. Keep an eye out for electrical tape joints and household type twist on connectors. Two sure signs that Jethro has been doing a little weekend electrical work. Both are prohibited as they eventually fall off, leaving exposed, often uh, energized conductors. Verify that uh, AC wiring is marine grade uh, stranded wire, vice residential style solid strand wire, uh, also known as Romex, and that outlets located at the galley, head, and machinery spaces and on all weather decks are GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupt, protected. Uh, fight or flight, if an electrical systems are maxed out or rife with problems, play it safe by getting an estimate to make it right from a competent marine electrician before negotiating with the owner on price. Pitfall number six, manufacturer's defects. It's a sad fact that some problems you'll encounter are fresh from the builder or caused by improper aftermarket installations by dealers or brokers. Warning signs, the sky's the limit with the range and type of problems you'll encounter. Common issues include holes drilled or cut into cord decks that aren't properly sealed against moisture entry. Windless hauls holes are notorious for this. Uh, inadequate backing plates for railings and cleats, unsupported wire runs, inaccessible fuel tanks, lack of seacocks on below the waterline through hole fittings. The list seems endless. Uh, using the wrong type of hose during an installation or failing to provide adequate shape protection are also common issues. Uh, fight or flight, uh, here's where a good marine surveyor is worth their weight in gold. It's the surveyor who, like crotchety old Aunt Emma did on your real first date way back when, picks and gnaws at your new love, ferreting out all those faults your own moonstruck eyes have failed to see. Uh, with survey report in hand, you can then work with the seller to correct these issues outright, uh, negotiate a reduced price, or determine if it's better just to find a boat with less issues.
If you're in the market for a boat, uh, a boat test sale is a great way to weed out potential lemons before spending your hard-earned cash on a marine survey. Sure, you could ride around with a mango margarita in one hand while the broker regales you with tales of faraway exotic lands. Uh, however, a smarter move would be to approach your test sale with planning and a critical eye. Here's how to glean as much info as possible about your potential purchase during a test sale. Test sale versus a sea trial. What's the difference? Well, a test sale is typically shorter than a formal sea trial, so you probably won't have time to do all of the tips we're going to talk about here shortly. If that's the case with your test sale, concentrate on the ones you feel will yield the most information in the amount of time you have. If you're not 100% confident in your ability to do any of them, just leave those for your surveyor to conduct during the official sea trial. A couple of things to consider when you're doing a test sale. One, leave the kids and the dog at home. Approach the test sale as a fact-finding mission, not a joyride. Restrict your guest list to those with an immediate interest in the boat buying decision. This means you can stay focused on the vessel's performance rather than whether your kids are behaving or if Fido's watering the upholstery. Another consideration is that from an evaluation standpoint, a test sale is more informative if conducted in less than ideal conditions. I'm not suggesting that they be carried out during a hurricane or during any unsafe condition for that matter, but it stands to reason that if you're buying an offshore sport fisherman, for example, a short run offshore would probably tell you a lot more about handling characteristics than a 10-knot cruise along some calm waterway. Uh, the first thing you want to ask the broker or seller when setting a day and time for the test sale is that they don't warm up the engine prior to your arrival. Uh, you can learn a lot from a cold start, but the most basic observation is how hard is the engine to start? A perfect time for weak batteries and other such problems to make themselves known. For example, excessive smoking during a cold start, uh, first thing in the morning, for example, could indicate oil leaking onto the pistons, something that wouldn't be as noticeable if the engine had started prior to your arrival. And let's be honest, most people when they're selling a boat, they like to warm things up because they're all kind of paranoid, you know, that something's not going to start or not going to work. So they'll crank the boat up, let it idle a little bit just to make sure. They'll do that before you arrive unless you tell them not to. Try to arrive a bit early uh, to the dock so you can familiarize yourself with the boat prior to getting underway. Check the bilges, bilge water level, presence of oily water in the bilge, etc. And compare that with how the bilges look once you return to the dock. Check or ask that the engine oil and coolant levels be checked, uh, as well as the transmission oil level before and after the trip, confirming correct fill levels and noting any changes that could indicate leaks. It's good to do this for hydraulic steering systems and trim tabs units as well, if applicable. Uh, check the generator oil and coolant levels if so equipped and ask that it be started at the beginning of the test cell and placed under as much load as possible, such as turning on the air conditioner or heating, uh, let it run during the entire test sale so you can observe its operation. Placing a clean drip cloth under both engine and generator prior to getting underway will make oil leaks uh, or any type of leak more noticeable once you're back at the dock. Uh, record your engine and generator hour meter readings before and after the test sale to verify that they're actually working. Once the seller has started the engine and generator, if there is one on board, take a moment to conduct a visual inspection for any fluid or exhaust leaks. Note the engine idle RPM. If it's greater than 800, it may have been bumped up to cover an idling problem. Ask that the engine be revved up to the 2000 RPM range, unloaded, to see how smooth the throttles operate and how the engine itself responds, noting any hesitation or bucking when throttled down. Uh, while still firmly tied to the dock, ask that the vessel be placed in forward, neutral, and reverse to check shifting, once again noting any unusual noises like chattering of the reduction gear or whatever. Once underway, record oil pressure and coolant temperature, volts, gearbox oil pressure, etc. for each engine during various speeds, slow throttle, half, full, and cruising speed. Record each of the above at all helm stations to compare readings and to verify gauge operation. In other words, if you've got a flying bridge and you've got a pilot house helm down below, you want to record the gauge readings to make sure that they jive with each other. If you have a non-contact or infrared thermometer and you're comfortable working around engines, here are a few additional things you could try to look at. Uh, one thing to note, however, is always be safety conscious and use appropriate safety gear, goggles, hearing protection, 
etc. Uh, when working around hot engines and any rotating equipment. Check the temperature of the engine oil pan, which is typically between 190 and 220 degrees, depending on the engine. Higher pan oil temps could indicate a fouled oil cooler, something you may be able to verify by comparing oil temps at the oil cooler intake and discharge. Temperatures should differ significantly if they're working properly. This works for transmission oil coolers as well. Uh, use your non-contact uh, thermometer to sweep the exhaust manifolds and risers for hot and cold spots. Manifold temps should be within 10% or so of each other. In other words, if you have a port and starboard uh, manifold, the temps you record should be within 10% of each other, while riser temps should be fairly close to the cooled part of the manifolds. Hot spots noted in any of the above could indicate blockage. Check all exhaust systems for coolant or gas leaks and listen to the muffler at idle for internal rattling, which could uh, mean broken baffles. You should also note the temperature of the stuffing box. The higher it is above ambient temperature, the more urgent the need for inspection and possibly maintenance. Uh, while underway, inspect stuffing boxes, dripless shaft seals, and rudder glands for leaks. It's not unusual for these to be dry at the dock, but for them to leak when the vessel is underway and making way. Uh, sh check the shaft for vibration at various speeds. If there's a visible wobble, you can get a rough idea of how bad the problem is by touching the top of the gearbox. Uh, if you can feel it there as well, the issue needs to be corrected sooner rather than later. If there's an engine manual on board, uh, note the uh, manufacturer's maximum recommended RPM. Uh, a lot of times the engine data tag will also have it on there. Uh, then after the engine is warmed up a bit, Ask that the engine be ran at full throttle for a short distance. If the owner's piloting the boat and you ask him to run it up to wide open throttle, he'll probably hem and haul and say, oh, well, you know, we don't really never run it up that, that high, you know, but if, if there's you know, nothing wrong with the system, the engine, it'll be fine running it up to wide open throttle for a short distance. But if they say they don't want to do it, then that's fine. Don't press the issue and just let your surveyor do it when he does his official sea trial. Uh, so the RPM that you read at wide open throttle should be within 100 RPM or so of the specs, uh, depending on the engine. A maximum RPM uh, higher than recommended could mean the prop is too small, while a lower RPM could indicate a prop that's too large in di diameter, pitch, or both. Uh, while running at maximum speed, wide open throttle, verify that the actual speed matches the advertised speed. In other words, if they said it'll go 30 knots, is it really going 30 knots? This is also the time to look for any unusual sights and sounds, burning smells, smoke, vibration, and the like. Uh, boat handling checks. It's always best to ask whoever is captaining the boat to perform any maneuvers or engine operational tests that you'd like to observe, rather than taking control of the vessel yourself if offered it. It's a move that could uh, place you in a liability situation. Along those lines, give the captain a heads up on any maneuvers you'd like him to perform prior to leaving the dock. During the course of the trip, they'll probably offer you the helm in efforts to increase your purchasing bloodlust, but make sure they're maintaining the helm during any test maneuvers, as we just mentioned. Uh, you should also reiterate that they're in charge of the vessel's operation at all times and should stop immediately if they feel a maneuver is unsafe for any reason. Uh, standard maneuvers uh, to check while under power include a back down test and a figure eight turn. The back down test, uh, reducing throttle quickly while shifting from cruising speed uh, to neutral, then to reverse and then increasing speed. Uh, this lets you check the engine mounts for excessive movements. Um, just be sure to provide sufficient time when shifting between forward and reverse. Uh, worn or misaligned engine mounts can cause uh, shaft alignment problems, meaning the mounts themselves may be bad or due for replacement in the near future. Figure eight turns at cruising speed are useful to verify maneuverability, handling, and that the vessel has an equal turning radius to port and starboard. Additional checks for sailboats include raising the mainsail, uh, unfurling the jib and check for smoothness of operation, and to inspect each for broken or sun deteriorated stitching. It's also a good time to check all reef points and lines. If unclear how the reefing system works, now's the time to ask. Check all sail hank and snap-on hardware as well as operation of the roller furling system if, if, if it's so equipped. Uh, one way to get a f good feel for the roller furling system is uh, hold your hand on the furling track or drum and turn it. 
hard or rough movement indicates the bearings may need to be replaced. Uh, a lot of these things utilize composite or plastic bearings, and they can get flat on one side, cause it to jump. Uh, continue by checking the condition of the furling line, particularly where it's connected to the drum, and all running rigging, halyards and sheets and such. If conducting maneuvers under sail, try a variety of tacks from close haul to downwind to check handling and vessel reaction. It's also a good time to check dagger board operation uh, if so equipped, as well as any downhaul systems on board. As you can see, there are plenty of things you can do to make a test sail productive, but that doesn't mean you can't have a good time as well. You can still listen to the raucous tales of the owner or broker. Uh, just tell them to hold off on the margaritas until after your work is done. While the term new boat owner can obviously mean someone new to boating, it can also be applied to an experienced boater who purchases a new boat. In addition to properly outfitting your new or new to you boat, here are additional things that all new boat owners should do. Number one, register or document your boat. When purchasing your new boat, verify with the appropriate state and federal agencies what paperwork is required and that you have the correct documents on board. For example, U.S. Coast Guard documented vessels are required to carry the original certificate of documentation on board, no photocopies, at all times during vessel operation. You'll also want to ensure all required decals and state registration numbers are properly displayed on your boat. In addition to properly displaying your boat's name and home port on the hull exterior, documented vessels are also required to display the number assigned to them on some clearly visible interior structural part of the hull. The number, preceded by the abbreviations NO, must be marked in block type Arabic numbers at least three inches high and must be permanently affixed so that alteration, removal, or replacement would be obvious and cause some scarring or damage to the surrounding hull area. Number two, get insurance. Just like your automobile, you want to have the proper type and amount of insurance on your new boat. While some boat insurance needs and terms will sound familiar, such as liability and coverage to your boat if it is damaged, you'll also encounter new types of coverage that are boating specific. These include environmental protection, which provides cleanup protection should your boat sink or if you accidentally spill fuel or discharge oil overboard. The type of boat you have, as well as your boating plans, will determine what insurance is needed. The owner of a small powerboat, for example, will obviously have different insurance requirements than a cruising sailboat. Start your insurance search by speaking with companies or brokers that specialize in marine insurance, both of which should be able to advise you on the type of coverage you need. When purchasing smaller boats, Check with your homeowner's insurance company to see if and to what extent your new boat would fall under its umbrella of coverage. Uh, some boat insurance coverage items may also mesh with your automobile policy. For example, your marine insurance may cover repairs to your boat's trailer in the event of a towing accident, while your auto insurance should cover the liability side of damage or injuries caused by your trailer. The key takeaway here is to know what both policies will and won't cover and make sure your insurance needs are met. Two additional tips when shopping for marine insurance. First, the cheapest quote is not necessarily the best option. When comparing quotes, particularly between a marine underwriter and one that provides uh, primarily automobile or homeowner's insurance, be sure you are comparing apples to apples. Verify that both are offering the same types of coverage and amounts before simply selecting the lowest offer. The inclusion of environmental cleanup protection in a typical marine policy is a good example of this, as many non-marine policies won't have it. Second, choose a policy that provides an agreed-upon hull value, one that specifically states the amount of money you will be paid in the event of a total loss. Assemble a vessel information folder. This is a centralized place for all of your boat stuff that you need to organize, such as registration paperwork, documentation, equipment manuals, insurance information, purchase receipts, work order receipts, and the like. Uh, zippered index notebooks or accordion-style folders work great for this. For smaller or more open boats, a small waterproof pouch to keep title or registration documents handy but safe and dry is also a good idea. Learn your boat's basic maintenance requirements and start a maintenance log. 
While helping with the purchase of my first boat, my dad commented, you know, you take care of the oil and the gas will take care of itself. Uh, it was a humorous way to stress that while the boat will let you know in no uncertain terms when it needs fuel, you have to take the initiative when it comes to maintaining your engine. Uh, every boat with an engine will at a minimum require routine annual maintenance, such as oil changes, filter, uh, fuel filter replacements, lower unit or gear case oil changes, and possibly winterization for those in colder climates. Uh, the first order of business for a new boat owner is to learn what maintenance is required and to make sure it gets done. A maintenance log makes that job easier by providing a centralized location to note and track all of the upkeep and maintenance required by your new boat. Use it to plan future maintenance from engine oil changes to hull waxing, as well as to document completed tasks. And if you have a trailer, don't forget it requires maintenance too. Unless you'll be doing it yourself, this is also the time to think about where you'll take your new boat for routine maintenance or repairs. Finding a good service center or marine mechanic are things best done before they're needed. Uh, it also uh, allows you to avoid the rush by planning and scheduling things such as annual maintenance or fall decommissioning or spring commissioning well in advance. Learn how to properly fuel your boat. Uh, seems like a no-brainer, but don't take it for granted. The open fuel system of a boat is different than the closed fuel system of an automobile, particularly with regards to vent spills resulting from overfilling the tank. Learning how to prevent these spills during fill-ups are crucial in avoiding environmental spills and the hefty fines they can generate. The other side of the fueling coin is to make sure you use the correct fuel in your boat. Check your owner's manual to verify recommended fuel octane requirements as well as restrictions regarding the use of ethanol fuels, specifically those greater than 10% ethanol or E10, as they can damage some marine engines. Be especially careful when fueling at roadside gas stations and fuel plazas. Unlike most marinas, they often carry higher ethanol blends, and the pump labeling uh, for them is often easy to miss. Uh, learn your boat and how to operate it correctly. The training and expertise to operate your new boat is an important step for any new boat purchase. While you definitely have to learn the basics, starting the engine, steering the boat, there's a lot of other skills that go along with operating your boat, from docking or launching a trailer boat to anchoring, navigation, and learning the rules of the road. This is true even for experienced buyers, particularly if transitioning to a new type of boat, such as from power to sail. Although the basics may be similar, a single-engine sailboat operates differently than a twin-engine powerboat. New to sailing owners may treat their new purchase like a powerboat with a big stick in the middle of it, to begin with, and that's not a problem. Everybody crawls before they walk, or in this case, throttle jockey before they sail. And it's a perfectly acceptable attitude as long as you learn your new boat and new skills. Crewing for other boat owners is a great way to learn about your own, as is taking boating education and safety courses, such as those offered by the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary, United States Power Squadron, as well as other state and local agencies and organizations. Learn how to tow and launch your trailer boat. The beauty of a trailer boat is you can easily explore new waters, but for new owners, it means learning three new skill sets to do it safely, towing, launching, and retrieving. If the plan is to utilize your existing vehicle to tow your new boat, do yourself a huge favor. Make sure it's sufficient to tow the boat you're buying. Uh, check the vehicle owner's manual to determine if the boat falls within the vehicle's maximum tow capacity, or GCVR, Gross Combined Vehicle Rating. Don't forget that this number includes not only the boat and trailer, but also the weight of everything inside it, such as fuel, water, coolers, and gear. Boat ramps can be a zoo at times, but there is a procedural etiquette involved when it comes to launching and retrieving just to keep things civil and flowing smoothly. Avoid being the recipient of muttered curses in the stink eye by taking the time to learn the protocols for the ramp you're using and practice both evolutions to improve your proficiency. Weekends are the busiest time at the boat ramp, so a visit during the week will allow you to practice launching and retrieving your boat without rushing or the critical gaze of the peanut gallery. Boat storage. After what type of boat do I want? Where will I keep it is the second most important question a buyer will ask themselves. Unless you live on the water or own your own lift or dock, the answer will likely be at a marina, on a trailer, or possibly both, as many marinas offer trailer boat storage options. For smaller boats with trailers, the answer can be as simple as parking in your garage or driveway. If the former, 
Ask yourself, will it fit inside the garage? If the latter, if they are neighborhood or homeowners association restrictions in place for long-term residential parking of your new boat. Oh boy, you've purchased your first boat and you're eager to hit the water and begin enjoying all of the benefits of new boat ownership. Fishing, wakeboarding, and those tropical drinks with the little umbrellas in them that the broker told you about. Not so fast. You may be ready, but is your boat? From basic essentials to safety gear, proper outfitting is the key to a safe, enjoyable day on the water. Here's the lowdown on what every boat needs. First up is required safety equipment. While your outfitting list will vary based on the type of boat and activities planned, a great place to start is with required safety equipment. Safety equipment is based on a number of factors, from vessel length to the number of people on board. You'll want to verify the requirements for your particular vessel and situation, uh, but here are the basics. First off, personal flotation devices, or PFDs. All recreational boats must carry a Coast Guard approved wearable PFD type 1, 2, 3, or 5 for each person on board. PFDs must be in good serviceable condition of the appropriate size for the intended wearer and readily accessible for use. Uh, that means not stowed in a locked compartment below decks or beneath a ton of gear in the cockpit locker. As a marine surveyor, I see a lot of PFDs still in plastic shipping bags, an effort by boat owners to keep them clean. However, these bags must be removed as well, otherwise they are not considered to be uh, readily accessible. When purchasing PFDs, one big consideration is wearability. A PFD provides no benefit if it is used, so choose those that are comfortable enough that they will actually be worn. Inflatable PFDs are a popular choice due to their lightweight and low profiles. Available in vest or belt-worn styles, each unit contains a CO2 canister, which automatically inflates a rubber bladder to provide flotation when the wearer enters the water. Uh, if you choose this style, be aware that they may have additional maintenance requirements other than standard life jackets and must be maintained per the manufacturer's recommendations. There must also be a minimum of one approved Type 4 throwable device, such as a throwable cushion or life ring. Type 4 devices are designed to be thrown to a person in the water, and while one is the minimum, it's always a good idea to carry more. Throwing several in the water not only increases the chances that the person in the water can reach it, but also makes it easier to spot the area where they went overboard. It's also a good idea to have at least one with an attached but detachable lanyard, which allows you to pull the person back to the boat. Portable fire extinguishers. The number of portable fire extinguishers your boat requires is based on factors such as the boat's length, whether it has an enclosed engine compartment, and if there's a fixed or permanently installed extinguishing system. The three primary classes of fires are Class A, which is combustible solids like wood, Class B, flammable liquids like gasoline or oil, and Class C, which is an electrical fires. New regulations uh, per 2022 call for extinguishers that use UL, Underwriters Laboratories, designations, a number and letter combination that indicates the square footage of the fire the extinguisher can put out and the type of fire it is effective against. <clears throat> for example, a 5B extinguisher indicates an extinguisher capable of putting out a Class B fire up to five square feet in size. Vessels less than 26 feet are required to carry at least one 5B portable fire extinguisher. Vessels 26 feet or more, but less than 40 feet must carry two 5B units or one 5B unit if a fixed fire extinguishing system is installed in the engine compartment. Those 40 feet or more, but not more than 65 feet, are required to carry three 5B units, two if a fixed extinguisher is installed. A single 20B portable fire extinguisher can be substituted for two 5B units. Note that these are the minimum requirements uh, and there are exceptions. For example, a vessel that less than 26 feet in length propelled by an outboard motor is not required to carry a portable fire extinguisher if the construction of the vessel will not permit the entrapment of explosive or flammable gases or vapors. My personal view is that no one has ever died from having too many fire extinguishers on board. Uh, always carry more than a minimum, 
and every boat powered by a combustion engine should have at least one on board. Visual Distress Signaling Devices Boats smaller than 16 feet are required to carry nighttime distress signaling devices when operating between sunset and sunrise, while boats 16 feet and larger must carry visual signals for both day and nighttime use. Approved visual distress signals fall into two categories, pyrotechnic and non-pyrotechnic devices. Pyrotechnic devices include red flares, handheld or aerial, orange smoke, handheld or floating, and launchers for aerial red meters or parachute flares. Non-pyrotechnical would include any other type of visual distress signal, such as distress flags or uh, electronic distress lights, which flash the Morris code for SOS. Flares are relatively inexpensive and a popular choice with boaters who typically meet minimum Coast Guard requirements via a combination of red handheld or aerial flares suitable for day and night use. Flares have to be Coast Guard or SOLAS, Safety of Life at Sea, approved. The following are examples of the variety and combination of devices that can be carried in order to meet the minimum requirements. Three handheld red flares approved for day and night use three handheld or floating orange smoke signals and one electric distress light, three combination day and night red flares, handheld, media, or parachute type, one handheld red flare and two parachute flares approved for day and night use, uh, and one distress flag for daytime use and one electric distress light for nighttime use. Meeting the minimum number required by law does not mean you're carrying all the signaling devices you'll want on board during an emergency. When needed, flares and other signaling devices are like winning lottery numbers. You just can't have too many of them. In my opinion, every vessel should carry at least double what's required by law, more when coastal or offshore cruising. Most every vessel will also be required to carry some form of sound producing device for use in an emergency or during restricted visibility. And even those that are not would do well to have one on board. Vessels less than 12 meters in length are required to carry an efficient sound producing device, such as a bell, air horn, or whistle. Vessels 12 meters or more in length must carry both a whistle and a bell. The minimum audible range for a whistle or horn, both terms can be used interchangeably, uh, required for a vessel 20 meters, 65.6 feet in length, but less than 75 meters, 246 feet in length is one nautical mile. The minimum range for a vessel 12 meters, 39.4 feet, but less than 20 meters is 0.5 nautical miles. Now that you have the required safety equipment, Let's take a look at outfitting required for proper operation of your new boat. First up, VHF radio. Cell phones have their uses, but if you want to communicate on the water directly to other boats or marine rescue organizations, a VHF radio is a necessity. A VHF radio with a properly registered Maritime Mobile Service Identity, MMSI, number is an invaluable aid in the event of an emergency one that makes it easier for rescue organizations such as the Coast Guard or tow services to locate you. Uh, a fixed mount 25 watt VHF radio provides greater operational distance, but even a five watt handheld VHF radio can be a lifesaver. Next up is an EPIRB or PLB. Uh, EPIRB is an emergency position indicating radio beacon, while a PLB is a personal locator beacon. Uh, when activated, uh, emergency beacons uh, such as the PLB and EPIRB transmit a coded message on the 406 megahertz distress frequency, which is then relayed via uh, Cosmos SARSAT global satellite system and earth stations to the nearest RCC, uh, Rescue Coordination Center. Featuring internal GPS, modern units can provide a location accuracy of approximately 100 yards. Every boat should also have some means of anchoring be it for fishing, swimming, or maintaining position in the event of an emergency. Anchor selection is based on a number of considerations, from the size and style of watercraft you own to the type of bottom you'll be anchoring in, mud, grass, sand, or rock, as well as water depth, wind, and water conditions you expect to encounter. 
Most anchor manufacturers will provide a table for matching boats to their product. As an example, a typical setup for a mid-sized powerboat, uh, approximately 25 feet, would be about a 13-pound anchor, uh, 15 foot or one quarter inch anchor chain, and let's say 200 feet of 7 16 diameter, three-stranded nylon anchor rod. Uh, two more items that you want to have, dock lines and fenders. How else can you secure and protect your boat while docking at the Yacht Club Tiki Bar for that all-you-can-eat wing special? Uh, each boat should carry a minimum of three lines for tying alongside a dock, a bow line, a stern line, and a spring line. Dock line sizes and lengths are based on the size of your boat. A good rule of thumb is uh, one-eighth of an inch uh, diameter line for every eight foot of boat length. Bow and stern lines should be at least two-thirds of your boat's length, while the spring line should be equal to your boat length. Uh, you should also have a minimum of two fenders to protect your boat when docked. More is better, and larger diameters uh, will provide greater protection. Uh, don't forget that you'll also need lines to hang the fenders in place. Finally, here are a few other great ideas you should consider having on board. Uh, first aid kit, sunblock, bug spray, a baler or bucket to remove water, paddles or oars, a waterproof flashlight, handheld uh, or a headlamp style, sturdy rust-proof knife, a floating keychain for your ignition key, and a basic toolbox with any special tools required for your boat, as well as a basic uh, spare parts list, such as an extra fan belt or maybe an impeller for your raw water pump.